Welcome to the Egg Whisperer Show, a program exclusively designed to promote reproductive health awareness and discuss fertility preservation options. Here is your host, the Harvard-educated fertility specialist, Dr. Amy. She's known as the Egg Whisperer. Fertility expert, Dr. Amy Lazadin. And you have yet another success story just launched by an East Bay fertility doctor. Hi, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Egg Whisperer Show. I am so excited to have Dr. Allison Rogers here from Chicago. Hi, Dr. Rogers. Hi. We're so excited to have you on today's show. And the topic is, how did Anderson Cooper get pregnant? And I'm so glad you're here. You're a fertility expert. So, of course, you're one of the best people to talk to us about this. But before I get started, I just want to read your bio because it's so impressive. Dr. Rogers is board certified in both OBGYN and reproductive endocrinology and infertility, practicing medicine since 2004. She completed her residency at Case Western Reserve Metro Health Medical Center Cleveland Clinic, followed by a fellowship at University of Texas Health Science Center in San Antonio. And she's had some personal experiences with secondary infertility and pregnancy loss herself that I'm sure she'll tell us about. So welcome to the show, Dr. Rogers. Thank you for having us on, having us on, being on. Thank you so much for having me. So tell us a little bit about yourself. So um, I am, as you know, a fertility specialist. I see patients in Chicago with Fertility Centers of Illinois. And I decided to go into fertility because I really love problem solving. And I really love trying to figure out what's wrong and how to fix it. And there is no bigger joy than having a child. And I love being able to help families who are struggling then go on to be able to have the families they want to have. When I was a fertility fellow, so I was already a fertility doctor, I uh, was trying to have my second child and struggled, and we went through IUIs, IVF, I ended up losing a few pregnancies, then I finally had my miracle rainbow baby, uh, who started off as twins and then self-reduced to one, Uh, and she's now nine, so not such a baby anymore, Uh, so, and then I went on to have a third child as well with some help, so I you know, really can empathize because I've literally been on the other side of the table when I'm talking to patients. So I can say, literally, I've been in your shoes. I know how it feels. So it's definitely, I wouldn't have wished it on the world. And while I was going through it, it was horrible. But looking back, I feel like I can relate to my patients in a really special way. Absolutely. Well, thank you for sharing such a personal story. I'm sure it makes your patients love you even more knowing that you're, you feel comfortable talking to them about this. So let's talk about Anderson Cooper. As you know, he's one of the most famous journalists. And when I saw that tweet this past week, I was like, so in love with that cute picture. So let's talk about it. Whether gay or straight, how does that happen? I want you to talk us through those steps. So what is your approach when someone like a guy like Anderson Cooper comes to you as a patient? So the first step is obviously to take a detailed history. We want to get to know each other, make see if there's any medical problems. And mainly for men, we want to look for infectious diseases, also like genetics, right? So we want to make sure they don't carry any genetic disorders that could be passed on. So we do some screening for that. And then really the first step is to create an embryo. And we do that with a donor egg and we mix it with the patient's sperm. And that is sort of the first step of this process. And how do you go about finding an egg donor? I mean, it could be so overwhelming. You just Google egg donor online and I imagine you're a very hands-on doc. So talk us through that process that you take your patients through. Yeah, so I'm blessed because I'm in a large practice, which I have my own team that I have a team of nurses who help my patients with egg donors. And then I also have a team of patients who help my nurses that help my patients with gestational carriers as well. So what we do is we get an egg donor and we can either find that egg donor uh, from a fresh donor who is willing to go through IVF just for that one intended parent. And this is the same whether you are a single man, a gay man, a single woman that needs an egg donor or a married woman to a man that needs an egg donor. So it doesn't actually matter who you are, the intended parent. And um, you can either have someone do a fresh IVF cycle for you where they go through stimulation where we, we give them hormones to make their, egg, their ovaries grow lots of eggs. And then we're able to do a procedure called an egg retrieval where we have a small needle 
while they're asleep, and we use that on the ultrasound, internal ultrasound probe to collect the eggs. I sort of say it's, and I've been through it myself, so I can probably say this, but it's kind of like getting your blood drawn, except a little deeper, and obviously not in your arm. So it's good that you're asleep for it, so you can stay still. Never use and, that analogy. I love it. I love that analogy. Sorry, keep going. <laughs> well, we think about getting our blood drawn, we think it's no big deal. So it's kind of the same thing. I mean, it's not like major surgery. It's about 15 minutes, and it's just a needle poke. And um, we then would, and the other ways that we can get egg donors are we can have eggs from an egg bank, just like we buy sperm from a sperm bank. You can buy eggs that are already uh, frozen and ready to be shipped. It's a little bit faster to do it that way for sure. And the other option is to use someone in your life. So a known egg donor, like a family member or something like sometimes um, people want to use a, you know, a you know, friend or a sibling or something, if it's a same-sex male couple, something like that. So, um, and just to clarify, a single man would not want to use his sister because obviously there's, they're related, but if there's a two male couple, sometimes the one guy's sperm and the other guy's sister as the egg donor, of course. So just oh, to clarify. Right. Yeah, no, but and there's a lot of a lot of different yeah. ways you can get eggs. And, you know, it's part of it is going to depend on um, if you're looking for a specific ethnicity that might be hard to find, some of it may be genetics. If you carry a genetic disorder that we want to avoid, some of it may be like, how many children do you want? If you really just want one child and that's all you want, egg, eggs from an egg bank may be quicker and a little bit faster and give you exactly what you need. If you want three kids, then you may want to get a fresh egg donor because you'll probably get more eggs and more embryos because with the eggs from the egg bank, you usually get about five to six eggs in a, in a lot of eggs. And so it's usually enough for one baby, but certainly probably not more than that. Great. I mean, that's exactly what I was going to ask you is how do you decide fresh versus frozen? And you just gave a beautiful explanation for people out there. So thank you for that. So you mentioned testing. Can you just go into a little bit more detail about the test that you do on the guy? Yeah. So um, of course we need to do a semen analysis and for a semen analysis, we can either have men collect a sample at home, which we're doing more now that it's, you know, a pandemic, um, or they can collect it at the office. We have special collection rooms and we like to have the sample between like around an hour after collection because you want to keep it warm. So the funny thing is when I lived in, in, I live in the Midwest, you know, it gets so cold, especially in the winter, you want to tell people you want to keep it next to body heat. You don't want it to get cold. However, then I did my fellowship in Texas and it was, you know, often 110, 115 degrees. And we tell people like, don't leave in your car too long. Make sure it's a normal temperature in your car. So, you know, huge variations. You want to keep it body right. temperature. So in Chicago, um, you need, in Chicago, you need a sperm Snuggie basically is what you're saying. Right. Like some sort right. of scarf with a little pouch and then you put the cup in there. Right. Yeah. So, um, so we do a sample and we look for a bunch of things in the sperm sample. So we look for sperm count. We also look for quality of sperm. So how the sperm are shaped. And we also look to see how many are moving because we want to see the health of the sperm. That's some of the ways that we tell if the sperm is healthy, has a good chance of fertilizing the egg. Yeah. I mean, that's super important. And then if you have two dads, sometimes one of them has better sperm than the other. And that could be maybe a thing that you do to choose which sperm source you use. Is that something that you've done before? Um, yes. I think a lot of times they have already have come in to see me with an idea of who they want. You know, sometimes they want to do both and they'll split the sperm, the sperm and the eggs will go half and half. So usually they already have that idea, but it's certainly something we can do. The other tests that are required are we do some, because remember the FDA is regulating all of this. And that sort of sounds scary when we use the words like regulation, but really it's for everyone's safety. We want to make sure everyone is protected from a mental health perspective, from a genetic perspective, from an infectious disease perspective, from an ethical perspective, we want to make sure everyone's protected. So it really is a good thing that the FDA oversees everything. And so there's some special infectious disease labs that we do, and that's just blood work. Um, and then uh, we also recommend genetic screening because all of the egg donors are screened genetically. And almost everyone carries some rare genetic disorder. You just want to make sure that the egg source and the sperm source don't carry the same recessive disorder because if you're both carriers for the same recessive disorder, then you have about a 25% chance of having a very sick child. But if you're just a recessive carrier for something and the, the let's say the egg donor is a carrier for something, but the sperm donor isn't a carrier for that, then the baby might be a carrier, but won't have a disease and, or has a very low chance of having the disease. So that is something that with today's 
genetics, we really do on everybody, and we do pretty extensive screening on genetics for everybody. I would recommend patients who are looking into either an egg donor or a sperm donor, for that matter, almost everybody carries something. So it's really important to not exclude people just because they carry something. If Because everybody, almost everybody does. So if there's a donor that you really like for whatever reasons, then, you know, just make sure you, you get yourself screened so that you can make sure that you'll have a healthy baby. And I wouldn't rule out donors just because they're, they carry a recessive disorder. And then you mentioned something, you mentioned ethical considerations. What are the ethical considerations and how is that um, screened? So we want to make sure everybody is comfortable. So for example, we want to make sure that everybody involved, and this is whether this is a single man or whether this is couples, it is really important to make sure everyone feels just really comfortable and have thought through the process. And think about things like, you know, what your future is going to look like when people say to you, oh, well, who's the baby's mom and stuff like that. It's important to be able to realize that people are going to ask questions and it's important to sort of be very comfortable from an emotional perspective in this journey, because obviously it's a big step. I always tell people like, these are supposed to be hard decisions. This isn't like, Hey, what are you having for lunch today? This is like, big life decision. And so it's important that you take the time. So we have all of our patients see both, you know, maybe a known donor, if you're using a known donor, plus the intent of parents, we have them talk to one of our mental health providers. It is Mental Health Awareness Month. Um, but just, um, but just for sort of support and guidance, because this is a process we, that can be emotionally difficult. And Obviously, in a situation of a single man, you know you're going to need an egg donor, you know you're going to need a gestational carrier, but it doesn't. it's not always that situation, right? And so it's important that we really sort of think through from an emotional perspective, sort of everything that's going on. And from an ethical perspective, it is also important, right? Sometimes people want to use like a younger relative as the egg donor or a coworker, or if it's a boss, they want to use one of their employees as a donor. Like there are some situations that, you know, come up that may not be the healthiest for everybody involved. And so it's really important from an ethical perspective that we, you know, make sure that everyone's doing it for the right reasons. Yeah. And in the moment it might seem like a good idea, but that's what our job is to kind of tell people, these are the pitfalls and you should probably not consider that. What about surrogacy? I mean, you hear about things like inseminating a surrogate. What is your approach to finding the right surrogate? So we have the embryo created. Yes. Tell us your approach. So I think when we think back, whatever, 20 years ago, when people originally started doing surrogacy, this was, you would take maybe the you know, the man's sperm, and you would put the sperm inside the woman's uterus, it would be her egg, she would carry the baby, and then she would give her baby off. And we've really moved away from this because of all, of course, the emotional and ethical concerns that ha that has. Of course, nobody wants to be just being a baby factory and giving their baby away. So what we do is when we use the term gestational carrier, and we kind of interchange this with surrogate a little bit, or gestational surrogate, you'll hear that term. What that means is it's someone else's eggs, somebody else's sperm, and then the woman is just the carrier. The woman will carry the pregnancy, and we can find donors, uh, gestational carriers, excuse me, in a couple of different ways. Sometimes people have someone in their life, right? Like sometimes people will say, you know, my brother is single and wants a baby, I'm going to carry a baby for him or whatever, right? So there are sometimes friends or family members who will offer to carry a pregnancy for somebody who cannot. And this is also single men, coupled men, and also women who have a uterus that is not usable. So this can really apply. This isn't just single men, but this is for anyone who might need a, you know, gestational carrier. And those gestational carriers also can be found through agencies. I've actually had quite a few patients recently find gestational carriers through um, online Facebook and other groups. And that sounds sketchy when you first hear about it. It's kind of like online dating. Like, would you really want to do that? But I will tell you, like I said, this process is all regulated by the FDA. So even if you find somebody through an agency, it's somebody known to you, or if you find them through a Facebook group, it is going to be still very, very important that they get screened. And they still have to go through all that FDA screening. Now, the gestational carrier doesn't have any genetics into the baby, right? So they don't need the genetic screening. But we need to make sure their uterus is healthy and can carry a pregnancy. We take a very detailed history. And remember, we hold gestational carriers up to a little bit of a higher standard than you would hold a 
maybe normal patient going through fertility. So if a patient's had premature deliveries or multiple C-sections or medical problems that have affected a pregnancy, they may be, you know, declined as a gestational carrier, even if that was a patient coming to me, I would have no problem getting them pregnant, right? Because this is a situation that we just hold them to a little bit of a different standard. And so we take a detailed history, we get, you know, you know, testing on their uterus, so usually some blood work, as well as we get some imaging of their uterus. Typically, I'll do something called a three-dimensional saline sonogram. If you're going through fertility and you're a woman, you probably had this done. Um, and I put a little uh, saline or fluid inside the uterine cavity. I do a three-dimensional ultrasound, and I look for any problems with the uterus polyps, fibroid scar tissue. If they've had a C-section, I will make sure it's well healed, make sure there's not any swollen tubes or anything like that. So even though like you might find this person through unconventional means, like we really do a very, very thorough screening. And I will tell you, it is so hard and I'm sure you can relate. It breaks my heart when I tell patients, like, I know you spent all this time, you've flown somebody down, you like, cause sometimes they come from different parts of the country, but I don't think she's the good, she's the one. And boy, that like, I, it, it hurts my heart to do that to somebody, but I also don't want them to use this gestational carrier and it not work out or for them to have a horrible complication. So it's really sort of my job as their, their fertility specialist, as the reproductive endocrinologist to evaluate that gestational carrier and make sure that they are a good fit for the patient. Yeah. And what are the chances? I'm sure you get this question all the time that the transfer is going to work the first time. Cause I think a lot of people have assumptions. They just do this and it's going to work the first time. So how do you yeah, counsel so your patients about that? Yeah, so that's a really good question. So it actually boils down to the age of the egg donor. And so if you're using a friend or a sister who is, you know, in her mid to late 30s, which I don't necessarily recommend, which is still young, much younger than me, but, you know, um, then it has to, the, the chances of miscarriage and the chances of things like Down syndrome are all relative to the age of the egg donor. So if you're using someone in the early 20s, your chances of success are incredibly high. Chances of miscarriage are incredibly low. I would say it depends on the lab. Obviously, every lab has a little bit of a different, um, you know, success rate, but probably somewhere in that 65 to 75% range. So incredibly high, but it is unfortunately not 100%. Yeah. And then if Anderson Cooper was a patient of yours starting his journey or any other gay dads, what is the most important piece of advice you would give to them at the beginning of their journey? Other than come see me, because I think everyone should. But what do you <laughs> think they That's should so know at the beginning? So I think it's really important to understand that it is a journey. There are ups and downs in every journey. There are, you know, amazing things, but every part is worth the prize at the end. And I would encourage patients who want a family to go for it because there's, you know, potentially, you know, very little reason why somebody like Anderson Cooper couldn't have a biological child. And it's just everyone's dream to have a baby, right? Not everyone's dream, but I mean, like all of our fertility patients, it's their dream to have the family they want to have. And everyone deserves to have that family. It doesn't matter who you are. You deserve to have the family you want. Amen. Thank you for saying that. Thank you for being a guest on today's show. I want you back. Please come Yay, back. I'll be we'll happy find, to come back. I would love to have you again. We'll be in my studio next time. Right now we're doing it like this for obvious reasons. But can yes. you tell us where can patients find you? Give us all your social media accounts. I want people to follow you and get oh, your Oh, fantastic. Advice. Okay. So on Facebook, it's Dr. Allison Rogers and it's A-L-L-I-S-O-N. And then my husband's nice Rogers, which is R-O-D-G-E-R-S. It's mine now for the last 20 years, but you know. Um, and on Instagram and TikTok, it's at dr. Allison.rogers. And then you can find my website. It's if you go to fcionline.com, you can find me. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rogers. So thank you everyone for watching today's show. Please tune in next time. Don't forget to hit subscribe on YouTube and sign up for my classes at the Egg Whisper School. See you guys soon. Bye. Welcome to the Egg Whisperer Show, a program exclusively designed to promote reproductive health awareness and discuss fertility preservation options. Here is your host, the Harvard-educated fertility specialist, Dr. Amy. She's known as the Egg Whisperer. Fertility expert, Dr. Amy Vazadeh. And you have yet another success story just launched by an East Bay fertility doctor. 